So hello, can you all hear me well? Nice. So thank you for coming today and we are actually really excited uh, that we finally have an opportunity to share our story about coming to work in a startup-like organization and to share our insights of what we saw there, including the teamwork and the possible technical depth you may see if you come to a startup like that. And the goal of this presentation is for you to be able to relate to at least one topic from there and maybe even bring something back to your own organization. So I am Donatas Kimutis and uh, most of my professional career I have worked as a .NET developer. Right now I'm working as a corporate entrepreneur and we'll get back to this topic l later. I'm also working in Vilnius University as a lecturer where I'm teaching applied oriented objective programming. I'm also studying at Vilnius University my master at computational science and I just love to play and watch basketball. I'm a huge fan of Marvel movies and from time to time I, I like to ride my motorcycle. Uh, hello everyone, uh, I invite I invite Savages uh, and I'm also working with Donatas in Mobile Life, Danske Bank. Uh, I've been uh, developing software for like 10 years now. Uh, consider to be myself uh, more or less of an architect. Uh, so some of you might see me in university also. Uh, I'm teaching in Vilnius University and giving lectures on uh, internet technologies and uh, also software architecture a bit. Uh, technologies included, can you hear me? Yeah. Technologies I've used in my life include Java, uh, Groovy, C Sharp, Go, and I myself I also am a student as Donatas, just I'm studying PhD, not Masters. Yes, so we are working in a bank which decided to create an innovation hub within the organization to challenge the status quo. But what that actually means? Well, Danske Bank is a huge organization which has 19,500 employees all over the world in 16 countries. So in other words, it's a huge corporate. And while having many benefits to that, it has some drawbacks as well. Try to push new changes into organization size like that, and you'll see that it's nearly impossible. So at 2014, heads of, heads of Danske Bank decided to start a new organization called Mobile Life. And the famous quote about the mobile life is that it has the muscle of a corporate, but the soul of a startup. So in mobile life, we are trying to build projects fast with innovative style. And if you are still wondering if we have to go to, to work wearing suits, the answer is no. This is for just a special occasion like conference. And uh, instead, we actually have a really creative environment which we, were, which we were able to create ourselves. And that you can see right here, we have a lot of green stuff. And right now mobile life is becoming more of the culture and the mindset that is being spread all over the Danske Bank. And we are really proud of that. But the most important thing that we are doing in mobile life is, we are, is that we are creating a meaningful and a useful product for people that could be used daily. And one of them is Sunday. So yes, one of the products we are working on is called Sunday.dk. And this is a platform for home buyers, owners, and sellers. And uh, it provides uh, capabilities to search for and explore for uh, your new home. If you are interested in buying, you can uh, create your profile, provide your personal budget, we do some calculations based on that. And if you are a seller, meaning you have a home already and you want to sell that or to remortgage, we can provide you an advice or when it's the best time to do the remortgage. So basically, we want our users to master the real estate financing and to be the masters on their own. How we do that uh, is by providing the responsive experience supported by the mobile apps, by our native apps, web apps, 
And we do have a quite huge technological stack behind that. We use Node.js, we use React, Go, C Sharp, MySQL, MS SQL, Redis, Elk stack. Uh, we have native apps, as I mentioned, iOS and Android. So for today's presentation, uh, we'll just focus on the buyer part, meaning the first one. So uh, now let's get to all the multicultural thing. And as Donatas was uh, talking previously, we really try to embrace the culture. And while we are beginning from the cultural part, we feel that it's essential in creating a successful stand -up, uh, startup like we are doing. So we are based in two different sites. We are in Vilnius and in Copenhagen. And we have all the teams cross sites. What that means is that we have developers working on both sides, we have testers working on both sides, and we have business people also working on both sides. And all of this is happening within single team's boundaries. So each team has members in Vilnius and in Copenhagen doing multiple different things. So uh, we try to cope with this by having a flat structured approach. If you heard how Donatas presented himself, he's a corporate entrepreneur, whatever that means, yes? But, oh, yeah. but basically that means whatever that means, because you should be, don't have label on, on your site. You can be one day a tester maybe, or a developer, or make some business decisions. So, but you don't need to feel the like, superiority of someone. Uh, technology for sure also helps. So if we look into the technology, uh, we can use process management tools like Jira mostly, or Trello at some cases. We use software lifecycle management. It's a Git workflow for managing code. It's Jenkins for managing continuous integration. We also do use uh, some kind of te communication technologies, such as Slack or Zoom for daily communication. And if we want to have a real quality thing, we can use telepresences or uh, maybe Google Hangouts and stuff. But I would say that the most important thing is the attitude and the mindset you have. You must have the attitude that you don't leave any person behind. This is the key thing. and. What not surprised us, but I would say what we are now feeling is this does not come as a given. You have to support that both ways, bottom down and uh, top, top down and bottom up. Also, multicultural aspect of this, we have two sides, but we have around 15 different nationalities. Sure, most of them are Lithuanians or Danish people, but we have people coming from the United States, from uh, Spain, Portugal, basically you name it. And even though we are just 800 kilometers away from each other, or one and a half hour flight from each other, uh, we actually are very culturally different. And we just try to pinpoint some of the key aspects if we compare just Lithuanians and, and Danish people. So we do have different management styles. and. It's more person-oriented on the Denmark end and more result-oriented in Lithuania. We have different working habits also. And uh, like, usually we feel that Danish part is less stressed and Lithuanians are really competitive and sometimes over-competitive. We have even different schools of programming, which was quite interesting for me. When you take an experienced developer being Lithuanian or coming from Denmark, we feel that on Lithuania, maybe we teach more about databases and the knowledge of that. And Denmark side is really focused on testing, on TDD, and similar stuff. So uh, I would say that the main aspect, however, is the different way we challenge each other. Basically, Danish people are more open to ask questions and challenge their opinions. And challenging is not a bad thing. If you know how to do this in a constructive manner, it usually brings value to the organization. So in Lithuania, we still are learning that. We tend just to comply to the rules. We tend to have some kind of hierarchy and status. And sometimes it might create hidden wounds when person wants to challenge but is afraid to challenge. 
and then he holds a grudge maybe even on someone. And this challenging mindset was maybe the most difficult part which we have to work on once we began because for some of us Lithuanians the challenging might be mistakenly taken as a personal offense. It isn't. You just need to learn how to take the best of that challenge. And once you learn that, it really brings value to organization. So being open and speaking is the key to rounding all the sharp corners you have in a such kind of a different uh, multinational setup. Yes, so and as Vaid has mentioned, we are working in the same teams. In the same team, we have people working in Lithuania and in Denmark. So it's kind of a remote team and it's a very mixed team. How many of you have colleagues in your team that are working from, from other country? Probably everyone, yeah. So the first thing that you have to solve is communication. How do, you that, how do you communicate and how do you still feel as one team while working from different sides? So let's say we take the most uh, primitive example and we have audio meetings. But we, if we have only audio meetings, we have a bunch of problems. We have no personal touch. You can't understand if the person, how, how he is uh, reacting to your thoughts. Is he liking or not? Of course, there are a lot of technical issues. And uh, if the background noises are just too loud, you immediately get the temptation to lose focus. But let's say we, we move past the audio meetings and decide to use video meetings for everything, for stand-ups, for groomings, for, for all kinds of situations. That works better, but we still have connection issues. But that's kind of a given if you're using internet. And video meeting has a problem that it's not as easy as just to turn to your colleague and speak. So if a good idea pops to your head, probably the first thing that you do is not that you want to create a meeting, you want to share it with someone who sits next to you. And the frustrating thing comes in when on the stand-up you start hearing things that from other side people started implementing some technical changes on the same code base that you are working on. And the things become redundant of what you are doing. And there are multiple reasons for that. The first one, your colleagues might just not like you. But let's hope that's not the case. Another thing, it, ha it is that it still has a title of a meeting. And most developers just hate to go to the meetings. And it actually is a bit true because if it's a meeting, it becomes a bit formal thing. And you know, you have to have an agenda, you have to reserve the time, the, the rooms are not always open. So it's a bit frustrating. But another thing that I found the most common in our situation is that we just simply forget to inform our side. So as I said, if you, a good idea pops to your head, you probably just are turning to your colleague and sharing that idea. So to solve that problem, we decided to use 24-7 setups. And 24-7 setup is consisted of all these things, so computer, large screen, microphone, speakers, and some video transmitting software that is turned on all the time. And this 24 setup is located at both sides. So when you're sitting, for example, in Lithuania, you have a huge screen in front of you, and you can see your Danish colleagues working. So if you're going for lunch, you can wave for them or show inappropriate gestures. And if, you're, if an idea pops to your head, you can just, you know, walk to the screen, unmute yourself, and speak. So it's pretty simple. And to be honest, this solved a lot of problems for us. Because when we started using this, we, we weren't feeling like a whole team. And after that, we, we, we got the feeling of integrity and of feeling one community. Now we can move to, the, to another topic and the differences of, uh, of coming to work in a startup-like organization. I personally came to Mobile Life from a traditional IT uh, organization which was providing IT services and products. 
And in Lithuania, it was acting as a local business. So it means that it has to find its own customers and provide the products. The team setup was like that, that we had an analytics team and project managers team. And the developers team was running on the side, so we were just getting the requirements. How we are going to implement it is up to us, so we, have, we can have a little fun, but we still have to fit the estimates. When I came to Mobile Life, I saw that the rules are a bit different here, and this is where the corpor corporate entrepreneur thing kicks in. Because we are not only the developers, we are also forming the product. So the requirements are very abstract, so to speak. And when you get them, you have to have a long grooming sessions. And you can have a huge impact of how the final product will look like. It's pretty fun, but it also has some drawbacks. Because if the requirements are abstract, you have to have a very long grooming sessions. And this still may lead into the failing sprints. So it's not all that fun. Yes, and I came also from quite a different uh, background. I was working mostly on water polish like projects in the acquiring bank industry. And firstly, what I noticed and what I suggested changing was, guys, let's define the working process, both technically and managementally. And let's have a zero downtime added it. This is the main thing I'm missing mostly in, stand -up, in startup organizations, that you just do stuff and hope that it will work, but you don't have that zero downtime attitude. We will do delivery next day and we have a downtime of two hours. Now it should not be happening like this. And if you have this mindset, it changes how you develop things. So it leads to a last point you see here. Know your database, because both as a data model and as infrastructure. Because usually when we do some kind of MVPs in a startup, you just do raw cruds and stuff, and you don't know exactly how it's uh, in beneath that, how it's actually working. So these now, what we've just covered, is uh, some basis why technical debt might happen in a startup organization. And now we'll try to look into concrete examples from the architecture perspective and from the code perspective, what we experienced and how at least we try to fix those. Yes, let's move on to the spicy thing, the technical debt. So what is this technical debt? It's a bad code, it's broken windows in the code, it's all sorts of things. And every developer knows that technical debt is a bad thing, but somehow, each IT company still has it. Then how does it happen? And startup by a name, it's just starting to develop new products, so, so maybe we can avoid it this time. And the short answer is no. The main reasons in startup organization why you cannot avoid any technical depth is that you are developing new product which doesn't have a final phase and the face of the product and the project and the requirements is changing constantly. So as, as a developer, you cannot create a perfect architecture for that, or you have to adjust all the time. But in, in a startup environment, you want to also keep the fast pace of the development, so you probably don't have time for that. Another thing is that if you're a startup, you're building new product, you want to get out to the market as fast as you can. So you want to build cool looking MVP solutions and give it to the customers. And if your code looks ugly, but your customers are happy, everyone should be happy, right? Yeah. And that is actually true. But the only thing that is missing here, when you release, you have to immediately solve the technical depth. Because if you won't, it will start to stack up. It will get, you know, the developers will start to get more and more frustrated. If you will need to add new functionality or to maintain the old one, it's going to take up more and more time. So, it's bad. And uh, one more thing to mention, this quote from Paul Barham, 
is about threading, but it also can be applied for microservices. Because if you're a startup, probably the, the biggest advice is, of course, not all the times, but to start from the monolith and you know, just to build your solution. And then you can separate it when you, when you know what is your domain. So start with one, and then you can scale it. And now I take over. So uh, now let's look into some practical example. Uh, we with Donatas at first came to the same team, and we were introduced into the architecture of the services maintained by a single team. And they, oh, it was so-called microservices-based architecture. What we see in here is basically some services which are owned by the team. We have some services which are owned by our teams and some services residing inside the bank, mainframe components and similar things. What I would like you to see in here, that we have here like PDF number one service, PDF number two service, and we have PDF generator service. Or we have a flow where we just call fire an event, another service listens for the event, some external service then receives a network call from that service, this is not owned by our team, and then uh, flow initial initializes once more using that service. First of all, it's amazingly difficult for the newcomer to understand how it works. And if you need to change a single piece, you don't even know where to start. It's a very good thing that guys have prepared at least like this kind of, this level of documentation and refer to. But on the other hand, we already see some drawbacks into the architecture itself and how it was made. So a service for each different PDF to be generated? Why do you need that? The motivation behind it in here would be, like you see, one service generates PDF, another service generates PDF. Since this PDF needs some pre-processing, it was thought that it would be wise that this is a separate microservice. So the question as always with microservices, how small is small? In my mind, this is way too small. A service for calling third-party service and just for passing data down the chain call, meaning that it's, it acts as a proxy. And we see an example uh, even here. This one external service, which, which calls our service, is actually just getting the data from another service of ours, doing some remapping and calling us once more. And if we need to do the changes, we, we need to ask another team to do the changes. Why it was made in, in this way, no one knows. But now it's different, at least. A service for returning fixed data sets, like yearly tax information. Those microservices you see in here have like municipality taxes of year 2017. And it's a microservice just returning the data. So, and it's used only by one consumer. So it was nice when someone started to develop and adding new features just by implementing each new feature request as a new microservice. But it led to the, this bunch of, and if this is only single team maintained services included here and their dependencies. It's even just a little piece of our domain we are working in the buyer domain I mentioned earlier. Also we have some cases where two business capabilities, uh, two business capability-wise different services, and they are coupled together just for performance reasons. So let's say we have once these, let's take, I don't know, two services, this one and this one, and initially it was a network call, then it was decided that this needs a better performance, and it was moved as a, as a library, and this is a good thing, but is it always really uh, needed that we would move them into the same code codebase? Maybe we can just move these things near each other infrastructure-wise. And this helped us out. I just want to point out that a remote procedure call is also a completely legit way of communicating with, between microservices. And 
now get let's get to the joys of mapping i think yes so if you're using the microservices architecture or you're just building microservices in the wrong way probably one of the biggest joys that you will encounter is the joys of mapping so if you have let's say we have this example and we have some sort of the front end application which provides the data for for us and then we have a chain of microservices which has to operate on that data and provide some results then it actually includes also the external service which also has to get that data so what we could do if we would do it wrong uh, we could pass from front-end application all the data to microservice number one and do the mapping here. I'm not already talking about the mapping inside the service. We'll talk about it later, but we do the mapping just in the DTO objects. And then from microservice number one, we are passing the same data to microservice number two. We do the mapping again. And you probably see the pattern that we, we do it all the chain down. And the biggest problems for that is that same field is getting mapped numerous times. If you would just look at one poor field right here that is called input number one, right here it can be called input number 27 or something. So this is very error prone because you can always forget to map one field or you can map it to the wrong field and it's of course very tightly coupled. If you have to change something in microservice number three, you have to change it from, from top of the chain. One of the possible solutions could be that the front end application is storing data itself some, somewhere and it's firing an event instead of the call and it provides only the key to the data set. In that way, this microservice can call with this key to the repository and, and just fetch the data and act on it however it wants. And maybe this microservice doesn't even care about what this one do. So it doesn't need to wait for this one to finish and to provide its own data. It can also subscribe to this event. So the suggestion probably would be to make it an event driven and to use, key, use keys to the data sets. And now we can move on to the guts of the microservice. Now we looked at the big picture, let's take a look inside and what happens there. And I really like this quote, don't build microliths. What actually means that please don't build monoliths as a microservices and call them microservices. Because there is a tendency that when you are a developer and you get a new technology, it's like a new toy for you, you know, you're feeling just like a kid and you want to play with it. But it turns out that most of the times you are over architecturing and you're probably adding unnecessary layers and you should always avoid it. You should always think, do you really, do you really need that layer? It doesn't matter that in some book it says so, you have to think it. Does it make sense in your domain? Let's take a look at another example. Let's say we have a requirement to acquire some data, well, to get some data provided for us, and then we want to collect some more external data, make some calculations on it, persist the data, and spit it out. So we could have a solution that looks like that. We have an API which uh, receives the request, then we have a domain service, which you know is responsible for all the business logic. Then we have a service agents, which collects all the data. And we have all those supporting projects. And of course, we have a database because we want to persist it. And that could be a good solution at some situations. But if we would take a closer look, we get a request to API. Then we, of course, want to map it to the DTO object because we want to control what comes into our service. Then we pass everything to the domain service where we remap all the things to the domain object. Then we are calling to service agents, filling up our domain object with also mapping. Then we perform some actions here and we would like to return, but we want to save it. So we pass to the database and then we ma map it again. 
So you feel the pattern and it's again all about mapping. So maybe we could avoid some, some of that. And let's imagine you get here 200 fields. So you have to do it all through here. And let's say you have 50 services. And all the services have 200 fields. So it's quite a lot. So I think that we at least can remove the domain service layer and service agent if, if we can from our domain. And uh, one could actually argue that uh, all those projects could be in the same core solution. And, uh, but that's probably up for a discussion and uh, the, the way of styling. So if you would remove those two, you would remove at least one layer of mapping and that would save up quite some time for you. And to, to cap the benefits of removing it, it's just uh, less code and not always, but sometimes it means the cleaner code and it's less error prone, it's easier to maintain and it's at least a bit closer to microservice. So now going more to the architecture thing, I firstly want to answer one question. Uh, someone asked what does a single team means, how big we are. So once we started in that team, we had like five, I think, developers, two testers, uh, some uh, business rules developers using our language, maybe two or three. So in total, I would say like around 12 people working on those services uh, shown previously, meaning on, on these services. And just to elaborate a bit on what Donatas was talking about, each of those was implemented more or less in such kind of fashion. So you can imagine the joys of mapping across services and within single service also. And the communication style used here is also some of them event driven, some of them network calls and the split between those is in question. But now we can go to a more theoretical part, the software architecture part. We split out the uh, home buyer domain. As I mentioned, we have on Sunday different domains like sell, buy, own. So I would say this is the buy domain. It's like more a generic view one we have, but still. So we have a core, uh, core subdomain. This is the buyer. We have some supporting domains, subdomains. And I use term subdomain not bound and constant here because it's more uh, like reverse engineering of what we encountered once we came. So we have some generic subdomains provided by third parties usually. And we see that we have one shared concept, budget. And also home. But now let's just focus on the budget. The buyer knows the budget. The loan knows the budget. The approval process knows the budget. In home we have also a budget. And even though that it's the same budget concept, the same name, it's really different business logic encapsulated inside of it. So the question is where and how you draw those boundaries and how the concept changes between those different boundaries. So in our case, uh, it was even that the core subdomain was and its concept budget was not the dominating one, as I would call. It was not the biggest. You couldn't just take the core domain's budget and split out of pieces of that into the, some kind of supporting domains. So this design and to make it properly in a startup environment, in, a, in, a, in general in a startup-ish like uh, organization is extremely difficult and we even went back and just now are moving towards refactoring those things to, to, to meet some kind of domain model. Also, once we hit that, we have a question. How do you divide subdomains across teams? Because as we see here, we could say that we just leave each subdomain for the one team to handle. And this is the classical approach you have, usually a single team per subdomain. And one team is not limited to single domain, meaning that one team could maintain more, more than one. We try to do that at first, but Combine this with the approach that we are flat structured and everyone should help everyone. We had some issues because we're, there were like some illusions that 
everyone should be able to help everyone, anyone. And it's not possible. And the term you put behind the full stack, that someone working on these solutions, which are c -sharp based can ask for help from the guys in here, maybe JavaScript. It's, it's not what full stack should mean, I think. But let's, let's, this is a separate topic. So the main issue here, how to solve that? At what point we had an idea, maybe single data model will help. Because we see those concepts like budget, home, maybe we can define a single data model, reuse it across all subdomains, and this will solve most of our mapping issues. Short answer is no. And even if the answer would be yes, I would say that the pain and the cost of maintaining that thing is way too high compared to the benefits you get in there. Uh, and what I feel from personal perspective, there is no feeling of commitment then. You have someone define the data model, then you just hit now to comply to that. And each team wants then to pull it into one dire direction or another. So a bit longer story here about single data model and what we tried, how we failed and how we are doing that now is we thought that creating a single data provider for whole Sunday DK buyer domain is a good idea. We thought that one team could even be maintaining that. We just give people responsibility to do that. And this team was responsible for all the data governments, meaning defining data model, defining business rules, enforcing those rules, etc. So then we started asking questions. Data versus business rules. Data is a one thing, and data model is a one thing. It's, it could be even quite static. But business rules are changing due to the nature of coming new requirements. So who converts those business needs firstly to the data model? And this was left for one team to do, for that data provider team to do. So they took the business needs as they thought and created some kind of model, which should suit everyone. Well, basically, you know the story. What suits everyone doesn't do anything good at all. And this happened. The design was flawed from the beginning. It was made in an expandable fashion somehow that anyone could possibly use that. But then when you make it very loose, there is a second question to that. Who defines unknown business rules? Because the way how data flows into the data model basically should be controlled by some business rules. And there was no way of defining consumer-specific business rules. So business rules were defined by that data provider team. This, on one hand, slowed the pace, how you can implement new changes, because it goes through one team. On the other hand, they are not experts of all subdomains. So those rules became maybe sometimes too generic, or you don't even know why are you blocked by one rule, not the other. And this led to a lot of workarounds on consumer end. Meaning, if some service here in a home domain somewhere, subdomain is trying to put data into the buyer domain using that single data model, and it doesn't work for some reason, because there are some business rules which, which are blocking that. But you don't know which rules are exactly, you just try to overcome those by using uh, some workarounds on your end. So this, the third question, who enforces them? Who enforces those business rules? And if it's one team and the team does not admit initial mistakes they made, they then you can use a wall of consistency. They say, we can't change anything because your change will break, change will have a breaking <coughs> effect on ours. And then you get stuck in a limbo state, more or less. And also maybe these even could be somehow resolved, but then the question is how you communicate those to consumers. If you have no formal documentation, and I'm not speaking about documentation of a data model itself, to document a data model is easy. You have an entity, some kind of diagram and stuff. Yeah? But how to document business rules? How each entity and why is attached to each other? And if there is no documentation, the consumer who tries to use the services just has to fail and try. And this means very low pace of integration and high resentment, both towards the data model and towards the team which is maintaining the data model.
And just to add a bit more confusion to that and to wrap up the talk about the data, I'm going to ask you a question. Is it always right to say that a single service should access a single database? What if the data is static and you know it changes once a year and you have to access it through fi from five different microservices? Maybe those services can actually access the database. Maybe you don't need that another service that is just a proxy of providing that data, just for you know, making the CRUD. Uh, if we are talking about the mutable data, then it's, of course, much more difficult because you have to think about the reading and writing strategies and it becomes very difficult. But if it's a static data, maybe it is okay. But I'll leave this question unanswered because probably there is no correct answer in this, in the, in this site. But I would like to say that uh, we shouldn't be afraid to do that. But it's still more anti-pattern than a pattern. So as Donat has mentioned, can we just go back one slide? We can. We are now having two different approaches. One is a team maintaining a data model, and our is sharing a database on low level. And most probably, either of those is not the perfect solution. So now we go to some, well, suggestions and considerations how we fixed at least part of those technical issues and that we encountered. So first of all, which helped a lot, is get, got, we got rid of an idea for uh, Utopian idea to have a single data model, which is usable across all the domains of interest. It took a lot of time to extract pieces of the data model and split all the business rules across different bounded contexts, different subdomains. But it really gave us the, the benefit then to accelerate the development when each team is responsible for their part of data. We also refactored some, some shortcuts made for performance reasons. And this is uh, like a suggestion, you should keep the logic separately, but this doesn't mean, at which I encounter most, is that a microservice is something called using network. No, it isn't. You can do remote procedure call. You can even treat library as a microservice of one, some sort. <coughs> and this helped us a lot because where we needed a lot of performance, what we did, we just located the services inside the same virtual machine, for example. But it's clear who owns them, it's clear who develops new features on them. Also, we removed some redundant RDBMS usage in the services which just act as proxies. As you remember, Donata showed that layers of mapping and in some cases, the service is just acting as a proxy. He just aggregates some additional data on top of the request and passes along. And if we needed to do tracing and logging in those cases, we usually used relational databases. We had all the models going down to the database and stuff. You don't need that. We just to start to use simple document source for that. So it's less mapping. We are really more flexible if the requirements are changing swiftly. Yes, and as, as I spoke previously that in, in a startup-like organization, you always want to keep a fast pace of development while still playing with new technologies. So when we came, we saw that there was a quite a mix, mixture of the things we are, that we are using. So the version control, some services were in TFS, some were in Git. So that's probably not a very good thing to have because then you have to remember or keep a list that it is being updated if a new guy comes and you know he doesn't know where to look. So we moved all the source code to, to Git. Then we fixed the deployment uh, process by creating and uh, improving the builds uh, in the TFS and then creating a nice pipeline in the Octopus. And then we moved, moved then we made small moves towards event-driven communication to, to solve the problems that we discussed previously. And to, to wrap up all that discussion, we would like to, for you to remember this, this quote, don't be part of the problem, try to be part of the solution.
So, thank you. And I saw that we have some questions. Yeah, I saw there is, there is a question by Marco. Uh, how do you manage the flat architecture discussions in your flat structure, uh, yeah, flat structure team? Is the, everyone involved or just a few guys? How do you communicate the decision later? And really great question because there was always uh, a rule that we don't put a tag architect on top of anyone inside our organization. And this leads to a lot of problems because everyone might feel as an architect. <laughs> but usually how it works, people just rise somehow naturally. You, at least from my experience, in each team we have uh, some more experienced guys who will usually gather together, to have a discussion. You don't have a label that he's an architect, but maybe they will find the most suitable way how to work that. And it's really sometimes painful, I do agree, and especially when you need to do a commitment, you need to say, okay, now we do this this way. Who says that it's the right way? No one does, but that's the beauty, that this is a team effort, but not only team as a team in a sense of single team, but as a team of mobile life in general. And this is a in really interesting approach, and it really helps to grow as a person and as a developer, I would say. Because this challenging approach, what uh, I mentioned uh, in the beginning, the multicultural thing and challenging, the Danish mentality, it really helps here because you're constantly challenging each other. So sometimes you have good architecture discussions just randomly. And out of that, even I think yesterday had a really good discussion in the morning when one guy came and say, said, hey, I just woke up and thought that we could do it this way. When we talked, when we went to the third guide, also talked when we did the telepresence, talked with two other guys, and now next Tuesday we're having a meeting of maybe changing uh, part of our system completely. But just to add to that uh, very shortly, in the beginning it can be really painful if you, don't, if you have a flat structure, uh, because I, I remember when we were discussing uh, different possibilities of branching strategies, it took two days for us. It shouldn't be that long, and uh, in the in the end, it was you know, it was boring. So, but in the long run, uh, someone, as Vida said, arises, and uh, everyone, you know, takes it as a natural architect go-to guy. Or, yeah. Usually, don't have a tag, but you know somehow who you can ask those questions. And one more question about the twenty-four-seven setups. Uh, how do you work in open space environments with that? Maybe you can. Uh, so we don't really have a typical open space environment because our our open space is divided to a parts where like 15 maybe people are sitting, uh, sometimes maybe 20, and we have walls. Uh, also, we when we were creating the office, uh, our manager decided that we need to have this voice proof uh, walls, which you know just observes the sound. So we have a pretty quiet environment, and to, for each team to have its own separate 24/7, uh, it's, it's not a problem because you know most of the time it's silent. Uh, just whenever someone starts to speak, when unmuted, then the discussion starts going. But it happens in the open office, not with only 24/7. All the colleagues, you know, are sometimes are just speaking. Yeah, and I will also add that 24/7 thing, and it's not that much of uh, speaking, which is the main part. The seeing is the main part. You see who is in the office at the moment. But it really helps, honestly. You just know if a guy doesn't respond to you on Slack, for example, and he's sitting near the PC, you have an issue. <laughs> or uh, you, <laughs> just, you just see that someone is really sick, for example, for some reason, just lying on the keyboard or, or something like that. So maybe you can ask a guy, hey, what, how is going on, you know? And if we have a like, time difference, one hour still, but you know when the guys come from lunch, you don't have to ask, you know, when the guys went to, for, a, for a lunch and stuff. But isn't this a privacy issue sort of? There is an open question to that, and it also this is the cultural thing we're touching now.
But the same thing can happen if you do not have 24-7 setup, if just your colleague who sits next to you is waiting for you. So I think that's just a bit of a psychological thing. Of course, the being filmed thing kicks in and it yeah. brings some pressure. But at least from my experience, you just get used to it. And it's, as I said, it worked really well. In the beginning... But, but this is, yeah, this is a personal thing. Can you sign some legal uh, documents about it? It depends, you know, yeah. But, but I can just say that we had some of those uh, removed because there, there were people in some teams which, who disagreed basically of being filmed. So yeah, it's a, it's a, well, it's a formal thing. You have to decide, but everyone is comfortable with that and we go along or we don't do that in that particular team. But on our team, for example, it was never the, the issue. But if you already have one guy who is not comfortable with that, either you place the camera in a way that he isn't filmed, if that's doable, or you don't film that area at all. But it, it's, really, it's really nice when you just can walk in the morning and see who is in the office. Is any of this recorded? I no. It live. no, it's just live. But you know, there is always possibility someone would record that, and this is the issue, what a person might bring. Okay, and we have one more question, which is asking, when you are saying a single team, how many people... I think I answered this one. It's like 12 to 15 people, depends on... Yes. But if I, when I say 15, it's all the product owner included, testers included, developers, business analysts. Yes. Any more questions? Uh, this is, I think, English, the main language, because in, even in Lithuanian office we have foreigners working. On Denmark side, even more, I think, people who are... Yeah, in Lithuania we have Spanish in the United States. Uh, Spanish states and... I think that's it. And in Denmark we have like 10 different nationalities working. So, so most of the time, even when Lithuanians are not in Denmark, uh, on Denmark side, they are speaking uh, in English. So the language barrier... Yes, sometimes, it it's, becomes a sometimes it's even funny when you are in the kitchen talking with real Lithuanians in English and you just realize that. But that's a good thing. That's, that means that you are already past that point that you have to force yourself to use another language. It's natural. And you know, feeling everyone included, I think this is, this is the main part. And we never had, I think, issues in the Denmark with that. Because yeah. everyone is really good with English and with speaking English. Maybe in Lithuania, for the newcomers, sometimes it might be unusual that you need to, to, to do everything in English. All the communication inside the team and site.